So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Cricket Sloan. Uh, Cricket is the um, lead data wrangler here at Stanford at the ENCO DCC. And if you don't know what a lead data wrangler does, she's pretty much the most important person in the whole ENCODE project. So um, I'll let you. She's going to talk today about our website and our methods for accessing the data. Hello. Um, I'm going to have one moment. Let me get my thing around. Great. So um, I am excited to talk to you guys about the ENCODE portal. And I wanted to start out with the fact that unlike the previous talks, I actually have already put out uh, demos. This is intended to be a workshop where you actually are poking around in our site. The demonstrations are really simple. They're just, you know, making sure that you have the functionality to interpret what you're seeing on our site and uh, navigate through the site. So um, you can, the first part of my talk will be without uh, demonstration. You can use that opportunity to follow along with the URLs and to um, get any sort of issues with your computer like connectivity or things like that handled, which brings me to my first slide. I starting with the acknowledgments because all of the people here in the DCC are also super important. I know Ben saying that the lead data wrangler is the most important, but that's just we're a huge team and we're all important and we're all here. So you will see people wandering around that have these little dots. Maybe they could stand up. Ooh, that would be great. Yeah. Right. So if at any point you're unable to connect or um, you're not understanding following along, those are the people to talk to. So excellent. Um, oh. So the other thing here is I have reference material. So these two links um, are leading to the slides as they are, which have lots of URLs on them, and to the demos that we're going to have to do. Oh, <laughs> my slides are not advancing. Oh, so here's the people. <laughs> there you go. So you know, the guy told me that I should rub my tummy to make the slides advance, <laughs> which is a true story. <laughs> So, okay, so here they are. Now they're advancing. I can make them work. So there's everyone in the DCC. There's the reference materials. Great. Um, and uh, I wanted to start out as I try to do all talks with the goals. But before I get the goals, I would like to get a sort of a feel of who my audience is. So I have three questions that I'd like to see a raise of hands for so I can kind of understand. Uh, before you were enrolled in this uh, meeting, who here had already gone to the ENCODE portal? Oh, awesome. <laughs> okay, and um, who here has a really good concept of what a DCC is and what their role is in a large consortia like this? Okay, <laughs> less. And um, who here is planning on their method of interacting with ENCODE data being primarily programmatic, that they're not really going to be navigating our site, but they're going to be downloading piles of data. OK. All right. So let me give you guys a little bit of orientation here in that those of you who are planning on just dumping all the data programmatically, the first part of my talk might seem ir irrelevant. However, I'm hoping what you're going to glean from that part is the data model behind what you're seeing. So even though you're like, oh yeah, this isn't really much detail, I'm hoping you're going to understand our data model. For those of you who are primarily going to be navigating our site, um, when I get to the programmatics where I'm actually putting little snippets of code up there. I actually am doing it in a simplistic method so you can have a take home to the programmatic people you work with to say, ah, yes, we need to know about JSON, REST API, this, that, and have a list. So, okay, excellent. So my first part of my talk is an overview of what is a DCC. Um, the role of the DCC is pretty, uh, wild and it's a parallel 
um, a parallel process to publication where the, da the data is coming, oh, sorry, the data is coming in from uh, the production labs and the production labs and the DAC give us a lot of information about what they want their standards to be. The DCC looks at all of that data, looks for anomalies and gives feedback about what is and isn't meeting those standards. Once we collate all that data, uh, we're distributing it to other relevant resources and uh, our central role is to disseminate that data for the scientific community, that would be you. Um, I'd like to just address the fact that at our project we're integrating not just ENCODE data but we also bring in the roadmap epigenomics and modern, uh, the modern code and modern data. We also are bringing in the genomics of gene research or no, regulation and we may have other projects in the future. One of the tasks that we do in here is we uh, integrate all these data using ontologies and controlled vocabulary so that what one person is calling heart here and another person is calling um, cardiac tissue here is coming together as one item. One of our goals is to collect very rich met metadata. We collect metadata on biosamples, on the antibodies, on the files themselves, on the software and the pipelines that are being used, um, the libraries that were created to be input to a ChIP-seq experiment or an RNA-seq experiment, and on the donors and or strains. One thing you'll note in our system is we were originally thinking of human, so mouse strains are called mouse donors which I think is really interesting and I think of them signing off on their consent forms. <laughs> so one of the things we do is we identify those reusable resources. So we give them actual names so people can talk about a biosample as ENCBS 000 AAA. I have highlighted here in yellow the encoding system of the accessions. So an experiment has an SR in it, a file has an FF in it, an antibody AB. All of these items are so that you can share these items and when you're talking about a pipeline, you won't be saying, oh, it's the ENCODE ChIP-seq pipeline. You would be saying, oh yes, it's ENCODE pipeline 00AA, 000AAA. So I'm gonna take a little detour on identifying biosamples. I find that a lot of people coming to our site have a little bit of trouble understanding when they see our list of biosamples. So we, um, we don't consider a cell line K562 a biosample in our sample or in our system. K562 is a biosample term. You can have a K562 sample and in this case, let's see, here we go. So, um, here we go, here is a cell line. It has two independent growths. Each of those independent growths would have their own identifiers. Those would go into a library, um, each into their own library, and those libraries themselves would have individual identifiers. Similarly, over here in a human, um, there might be heart tissue and liver tissue that come out. That liver tissue might be further separated. The heart tissue might not be separated but then have two separate libraries prepared. Every one of these are getting their own biosample identifier even if their biosample term was all heart or liver. Okay, so one of the key things that we care about um, in the ECODE DCC is tracking uh, the provenance of the data and where it came from. I'm sure all of you who have had this experience where you've downloaded a bunch of files and they say things like heart, filtered, trimmed, um, chip, and some coded target name. We are really trying to get away from that and have every single detail of what uh, was, went into making that process file. So here, you'll see that there's a process file that you download, like Zping was talking about, like a peak file. We try to track the, pop, the pipelines and the software that went into that file and to indicate all the uh, pro process files that went into that processed file. The software that used to develop that, going all the way back to the raw data 
the replicate structure and the particular biosamples and which experiments it belonged to. So this is a key slide to refer back to for those who are programmatically accessing and trying to navigate through our metadata. So those of you who have never heard of a DCC, which seemed to be like most of you, or not heard of, but did not understand what a DCC was doing, which seemed to be most of you, we do curation, we do data integration, we try to do data standardization, resource identification, we track provenance and context, uh, we promote reproducibility, and our ultimate goal is data sharing. All right. So our next topic, after you've been oriented to our DCC, is the site navigation. So I'm hoping that all of you are on encodeproject.org and are looking at our very first page. Um, I think you've seen this on Mike's Paisen slide in the beginning. Uh, the key things I wanted to point out, and we'll start in a circle here is we have a quick help in the bottom that will help get you started. We have recent news where we put things like our updates. We have the keyword search or the um, text search, which we'll talk a lot about later. And then we have each of these menus. This entire bar per, uh, is persistent throughout every page, and these menus are persistent. Okay, so in those menus, we have first the help and resources. I just want to point out that we are, these people that we showed you here are already, are all live all the time at the help desk. And when you email the help desk, you're getting one of our smiley faces answering you. Also, if you want more information about the data, there is an announce so you can get uh, announcements as they're made. I believe you've been told before that we have our tutorials and our release policy. I'm going to move over because I feel Mike Payson handled this. Additionally, I think that he handled our documentation. We have our publications and our experimental standards. We also have more information in the tutorials. Um, the publications pages, when you get through the publications, there are some uh, publications where we know the data set that went with them. You can see this link here on, that will have a data set, and this will list all of the files that went into that publication. We try to do this to promote reproducibility. Um, here is our biosample page. That was under the materials and methods. And that first page, you'll see uh, materials and methods and biosample. Um, we're not going to delve too much into the biosamples and antibodies other than I'd like you to know that they're there and that we have these pages that have all of the details that we collect um, with our um, goal towards deep and rich metadata. Again, here's the antibody page. You'll see that under your materials and methods. You, would move, you can move down and you'll see the whole list of antibodies. You can drill down further to see a particular antibody lot. You can drill down further here to have characterization information and drill down further to get the exact characterization. Um, the next item on that bar was the encyclopedia access. So I believe Ziping has already talked about the encyclopedia. You have both the about, which will lead to the whole section she talked about earlier, and then we have a matrix that will um, identify individual annotation files, um, primarily in bed in bed big bed format that you could download. Okay, so starting here is when we're going to actually try to search data together. So the first, or what I'm trying to get here is just for you to understand how you can browse and search through our data. Um, oh, look at that X. Um, when you're at our site, there are three primary views that you can see experiments in. And so now we're on that front page you saw. The 
there's the bar on the far part, there's the one that says data. And there's a matrix view and a search view. This search view is our primary page. It was our first developed one. Um, we have the action buttons up here. We have filters, which we're going to talk a lot about later. And the key thing I'd like for you to understand about this page is it's by a per experiment basis. So each one of these rows represents an experiment. You can use these little view changers here to get to the report view. What has happened here is we've collapsed into a tabular view. The features that come with the tabular view is that you can sort by any of these. And so um, if you were looking on that front page and you got to the report view at this point, you could click on accession and sort by there or target and sort by there. The other feature that you can do is you can click on this columns and you can adjust what the columns are that are in that report view. And then um, the third feature of this view is that you can download this whole um, page as a TSV. The next view is the matrix view. What is key on this view is that it is collapsed by biosample term. So we have just discussed that I have biosamples where every growth of K562 is its own biosample. This here is collapsed by a biosample term, which means that this row of K562 not only represents every growth of K562, but um, any K562 that has been modified in any way. Um, the top here in the matrix view is organized by assay, sort of giving you a perspective of which biosample terms have been covered in the most different assays. I believe Mike and Ping covered that we have DNA assays, we have um, rampage to discover transcription start sites. Um, we have various chip seek assays as well. So as I said earlier, we're going to hit this, this search box pretty thoroughly here. And that brings us to on our bit.ly, the demo one, the free text search of ENCODE. Um, what I'm going to have you do in that free text search of ENCODE is to enter skin into your search box. And if you wait just a second, I'm going to bring it up on my machine so I can make sure I'm with you. All right. All right, so you, sit, you hit skin on that, or you hit, you type skin and you hit return. When you've typed skin and you hit return, the first page you're going to see, you'll get a, an option of what type of data type that you want to click on. So we're going to look at experiments, as that's the primary way to access ENCODE data. However, there are many ways to access it. So you'll click on experiment and it will come down to a page that looks like this. And we're going to filter by ENCODE data. This is a place for me to point out once again that we're incorporating data from other projects like Mod ENCODE and Roadmap. Those projects, although are incorporated, are not necessarily um, done in the same uniform way as our data is from ENCODE. Another thing to note here is that you, the skin that you entered earlier wasn't just a text match. It is um, an ontological search. We are using all of the relationships that we um, have brought in from CL and Uberon to recognize that a fibroblast of dermis is a data type that you might want to be looking for if you're looking for skin. All right, on to demo two. 
So that was one way to enter, is just put in a term of interest and search and see what you get. Another one is to use our browsing and filtering features. So um, this starts out that if you start from search, or from data, or here, I'm pointing data to search, you'll get to our search view as I discussed earlier. And if you wanna make decisions here, you can um, look at these facets and make decisions like just clicking on, oh, here we go, make decisions like clicking on the project and the assay and the, um, uh, the organ. And I believe that we have, not on this screen, but I'm pretty certain you'll see that in the demo we've asked you to choose um, ENCODE, and we've come to that same group of data by selecting skin under the organ facet. How is that? <laughs> All right. No one has any questions. Their site works perfect. Yay! Making sure I'm with you. Okay. So now we come to the how you would combine this data together. So on the demo three, it's a combined search and filter of the ENCODE data. In this case, we start out by putting search, or search, putting skin in the search box. You select experiment. When you get to this page, we're gonna select RNA-seq as our assay, and we're gonna select um, adult as the life stage. And if no data has changed in the last week, I believe you will be down to 14 items on your list. In this way, you can start with, I think we have 10,000 um, experiments on our site, and very quickly narrow down to what you're looking for. I just want RNA-seq, I just want ENCODE data, I just want adult. We went from 10,000 to 14 in just a few moments. We were modeling after Zappos. <sighs> okay. Um, when you then can click on one of these RNA-seq, which I hope I have the right one, click on the RNA-seq of the uh, Milana site of, set of skin, that brings us to the experiments details page. So, on the experiment detail page, there is a lot of information, so much so that it takes two slides for me. The top of this uh, page has two sections. So on this side, we have a lot of details about the experiment, and on this side, we focus on what we call attribution. What project it's from, who did it, who was the uh, PI for the grant, um, other places where you could find that data, if it came from ENCODE or Roadmap or GEO, it may have links to other uh, sources for that data. Over here, you're gonna find uh, details like um, the biosample summary and the target, what controls you're using, more of the biological information. The next section is our replicates. So, um, we try to, in ENCODE, to replicate our data, um, and replicate structure can vary significantly for many reasons. We list here the replicate with the biosample link and information about the library, and then again, the summary of what that data is. The next, actually, I wanna go I wanna explain the files and then come back. So let me move a little bit down. You'll see down here is the list of all the files that go with that experiment. So the files that go with that experiment, we've divided into raw data. These are fast queues or um, array files. And then we have the process data. This is data that has been in some way processed from that raw data, whether it's a mapping or a mapping and a peak calling. Then we have um, 
for each of those, you can filter here. I'm hoping you guys can see those little boxes. Uh, if we have multiple assemblies available, you can click on that, oops, back. There you go. You can click on that and you will see a choice of all assemblies or GRC H38 or HD19 and that will filter your files for you. Going back to this image now is given context because what it is is it's trying to show you how all of those files are related. So in this case, we have some fast queues that go into a processing. Um, they get mapped. We have a genomic mapping and a transcriptome mapping. Um, and signals are called off of that mapping. I'd like you to take a moment to start clicking on that graph and you can see underneath, um, between, uh, here you'll start to see information about that particular file or that particular software. Yeah. All right. So the, um, that graph is meant as sort of a visual cue of how the experiment's related and to have you, allow you to delve deeper into pipeline and software information. The next part on this table is the, um, the controlled by, this, uh, it, or controls, sorry. Some experiments are used to control other experiments. A lot of the RNA-seq experiments are used as controls for the Rampage experiments, and so that relationship is indicated there. And then the final page here is the protocol documents. It, will, it has all the protocols that uh, the lab has given us even regarding maybe library production or, um, sorry, library production or uh, how the biosample was collected or how the software was handled. Um, I wanted to take a little side note on a, a slide that I don't have, but it realized listening to Zi Ping. Zi Ping was talking about the annotations that we have. So in addition to experiments where we consider an experiment to be a wet lab experience where we have taken some sort of uh, tissue and we have harassed it in some way and then we've done sequencing on it. The annotations uh, objects are for holding uh, maybe what you might consider a computational experiment where they've taken all of this what she's called ground level data, combined it in some way and um, come up with an annotation like can or what is not candidate enhancer-like regions. So there are objects in our um, system where you will come to pages that look very similar to this, but they will be annotation pages. Another thing that I wanted to... <laughs> so I think that um, we had a backup site for it. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we had a contingency for if we had too much uh, access on the page at once. Um, okay. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to pause for a minute while we start out that, and um, okay. But so she's saying that that um, Stanford requires you to reconnect every once in a while to the vi Stanford visitor, but I think that that is distinct problem from <laughs> not being able to access the site. I believe that I was told this morning when I was worrying about this that the answer to my worries is to not do live demos. So. <laughs> <laughs> the user sites up. I don't. I have no way to enter it or write it. Okay.
So users.production.encodedcc.org. This is our backup site. You'll see a red bar across everything indicating that it's not live. So are we on? Yay. <laughs> well, wait till you're all on it. <laughs> um, ben, should I direct some people to test? So you can also go to test.encodecc.org as well if people want to be on that one so we have sort of a distribution. All right, so are we back on target? I have no idea how long ago you, I lost y'all. <laughs> Much further. <laughs> Yeah. So about here, should I go back? Yeah. Okay. So this is a great thing to talk about URLs. So you can just ignore this whole first part that says encodeproject.org. You have whatever URL yours is, and you can add slash experiments, ENCSR 00CUR. Or you can take that number, ENCSR000CUR, and just put it in the search box, and you should get these exper this experiment coming up so you're looking at the same page. I also want to take this moment to point out the reason Ben was really excited to, to announce me is because that meant he wasn't giving this talk. Okay. <laughs> All right. So some of you can go back to the site. Some of you can go to uh, the users.production.encodecc, and some of you can be on test. We have three different versions of this site up and going, and now we've recovered. All right. So I'll try to more quickly go over this, which is that now that you've gone through all your search and you've narrowed in on your experiment, I wanted to orient you to what you were seeing and what kinds of data are available for those of you who are just going to um, access it programmatically. So we have a couple sections, the attribution section, I believe we discussed, that has what project it's from, who owns it, links to other uh, resources for it and the uh, release date. And then we have information about the actual biosample, the uh, controls, the more scientific core information of that experiment. This section here is the replicates and the replicate structure. And that has the specific links to the bio, well, the specific links to the biosamples, and a summary of the bio, uh, summary of the biosample and all the details that go into it. Also, if this were a chip seek experiment, the antibody would have a link here as well. Um, and then we discussed how you have files here, which you could filter by assembly or all of the assemblies, and that this. Um, graph here is designed to show you the relationship of all of the files that you see in that list. So sometimes you see these giant lists, but it's really unclear how the files are related or what you are looking at. This is a dynamic graph that tries to use the derived from information and the software processing information to build a graph to show you what those relationships are. Okay, that's a fun question. <laughs> so what she's asking is how final is the data that is out there? 
And the, the simple answer to that is that for process data, there will always be a newer, faster, better version. Um, we are working right now to bring all of the human data that we have to GRCH38 in a fixed pipeline. You can ask us in particular what is the most recent pipeline. That's one of the reasons we identify pipelines so that you can uh, recognize if you have one set of data that is done with a pipeline that is different than the others. You will see that our ENCODE 2 data has not been brought up to the level of ENCODE 3. We are working on that. Um, the goal is for every bit of data that has enough reads, enough replicates, meets all the criteria of ENCODE 3 data, we will run it through the ENCODE 3 processing, data, uh, processing pipeline and we will bring it up to uh, uniform with the ENCODE 3 um, and bring it up to GRCH38. So you will see a diversity throughout the site of some data at HD19, some at GRCH38, and with mouse, we have an even more of a complexity in that you will see some at MM9, some at MM10 minimal, and you'll see some new ones coming out at our full MM10. So, yes. Okay, so this is uh, an experiment is core around the actual experimental data. So consider the experiment accession as the we did this experiment. The processing may keep um, improving and that processing will have an accession that is the, um, the pipeline itself. So if you were to be poking around in this page, you'll, if you click on, uh, if you click on any of these blue boxes, um, which I can't do for you live, but if you click on the blue boxes, you will uh, see somewhere where it says pipeline, and that will have an accession number for the pipeline um, or, and or name. Now that I'm not seeing it, let me, I can pull it up to tell you if it's a name or a... So, the answer, so the answer to the question is, we don't plan on changing the pipelines frequently and dramatically. They kind of come in larger chunks. So um, for ENCODE 3, we have um, pretty much a fixed version for the RNA-seq, the chip-seq, and, DNA, or, and we have maybe two versions for DNAs. They will be labeled with different pipeline versions on the software. However, the experiment is actually accessioning the experiment in itself. So imagine the wet lab person at the bench. And that's what that ex is accessioning. Does that answer your question? It was you, right? Okay. All right, so you had a little time to navigate through our graph. And the site's still working. Excellent. So I wanted to, to introduce you to one other thing, and um, I threw this slide in late because we hadn't developed, we haven't really got this developed for human yet, so I wanted to switch over to mouse, just so you can see. One of the other things we're doing is we're generating these more curated sets um, where we collect data together for a particular reason. So in this case, over in the attribution, you would see a related data set. If you hovered on it, it says this is a reference epigenome for embryonic facial prominence at 15.5 days. So this is a collection of data that um, we intend to keep up to snuff with the IHEC um, standards for what a reference epigenome is, and we have selected as close of data as we can to represent that reference epigenome. And so when you click on that, you can see other experiments that are related in that data set. Other relations we have is um, 
organism, organismal time point. So it could be that a uh, ChIP-seq assay was done on the same tissue but over different developmental time points. We can collect all of that into a data set and so then it would say, oh, I'm also part of this data set. So you can see this collection of data together. Okay, so where are we with time with all of that? Okay, good. Okay, so on we go to try to search another thing, which is um, we have just released our first version of region search, which I believe both Mike and Ziping showed you. Um, if we were to go to the main page again, you would see the data and you could go down to search by region and it will come up with this page right here. So as this is our version one, I wanna tell you some details and caveats about it. Um, it takes as input the gene ID um, or HGNC symbol. If you start typing in a symbol, it will try to guess for you and say, oh, are you thinking about this or that? You can also put in a uh, coordinate range like uh, CH1 and give it the actual coordinates. Um, it takes RSIDs and ensemble IDs. Um, and then it will take your identifiers to this genomic coordinates and then it will co um, convert them to a specific assembly. So this is version one. Your only assembly choice is HD19. <laughs> we are working on being able to allow you to, to work with mouse and GRCH38 and mouse MM10 and MM9. Um, this then goes through all of the available bed files that we have and looks for an intersection with that uh, coordinate with a file, um, a bed file of that type. Again, this is version one. So we only are intersecting with TF chip and DNA seq at the moment. And I know all of you are like, oh wait, why don't I have uh, the histones? Well, it will be there. <laughs> um, when, when all of this has happened, it's gonna return for you a list of experiments that have files in them that intersect. So uh, I believe you have a demo that takes you through BRCA1 and then has you filter down by MCF7. Um, just a few days ago, one of uh, our colleagues and users of ENCODE data pointed out that they had used um, they had been doing research on this SNP. You can see the reference here for the abstract. And that if we put that SNP in, that she interestingly found DNA seq overlaps in nine different cell types that were interesting for her. So I wanted to show you another example of how one might use this. I also hear the idea that that's great if you have one SNP, what happens if you have 50, what happens if you have 500? And again, we are, um, I, we have been prioritizing the width of the search before the depth of the search. So like we wanna make sure that we get all the histone data and the mouse in, and then we can start working on the interface for what does it mean when you ask for 500? Do you want it to intersect all 500? Do you want that to be an and or an or? So we will work on that as well. All right, so um, we've, yes, okay, great. So now we're to visualizing and downloading the data and um, you have your next demo which is the visualized data demo. When you have filtered the data, whether it's by region search or by using the search box or by using these filters, um, once you get down below, I think it's 100 at this point, because if you try to visualize more than 100 on the genome browser, it doesn't really make that much sense. Once you get down below a particular number, um, you will get a button that says visualize. When you click on that button, it will, um, if there is an option for you, it will say what are the assemblies you would like to visualize on. Um, and that depends on what data you've selected. And then you select that and you are magically transported to the UCSC genome browser. How is that working? 
wish I could like see a mirror so I could see if everybody's pages were on. Okay, so once you're at the UCSC Genome Browser, great, thank you. <laughs> once you're at the, U oh, you're getting all yellow. That's interesting. Oh, I actually, you, okay. Okay, so once you're at the UCSC Genome Browser, hopefully you're seeing something more like this screen and not like his screen. And um, each one of these um, tracks represents a file. And if you look below, you'll see something called Hub Search, which is their track hubs, which is a bingo word in case bingo is still going. Um, Oh, so the track hubs aren't working. If you're at the users dot production, yes, do they work at test? Okay, so they'll work at test, and they'll work at um, if uh, our site that's back up, which is encoproject.org. Okay, so. We have um, one thing I want you to get clear if you're used, we're used to working with the UCSC Genome Browser is this comes up as a track hub and each experiment comes up as an individual uh, item at the track hub to which you can click on those and you can see metadata that will link you back to the experiment of choice. All right. I want to put a little plug in here that right now one of the um, issues is that for the short names, because you can only have 16 characters there, we only we have the ENCFF numbers. However, if you do hover over it or if you expand it, you get a longer name that tells you more detailed what that file is. And that this summer we are working on improving our track hub interface of making better track hubs. All right, so were people able to get to the UCSC browser? Yay. All right, so batch download of data. Um, one thing I didn't talk about earlier is any given file, if you get to that file, there's like a little button you can click on it and it downloads. You can download the individual uh, like protocol documents. However, this is batch download. I want to download huge amounts of your data. So there is a demo six for that. Again, once you've filtered to the collection that you're interested in, you have a download button. That download button is going to give you a f one singular file that is a list of all the files that you're interested in and a HTTP to a metadata link. I recommend not using that metadata link. I recommend using JSON and the REST API, which we're gonna talk about to get the metadata. But for those of you who are not used to using JSON, um, it does come in the TSV. So you click on the link, you'll see this box. It will talk to you about where to get help. It'll talk to you about the command you're gonna need to use on uh, your machine. So some of you will be set up to use this right away and say, of course, I use curl all the time. And others of you at this point are going to say, what, where do I type in command line? Okay, so you click on download and you'll see a little files.txt. And you will then get a file that looks something like this. Um, part one, the metadata. Don't take files without the metadata. That's sort of my number one lesson to everyone. Um, right here is the HTTP for a link with a TSV of the metadata for everything that's in this file. However, you would also be able to get it using JSON from the link that we were just at. And I will show you that when we get to REST API. And then part two is the actual files. Back to this box is you now have this file downloaded on your site called files.tsv or txt, sorry, files.txt. You um, put this command in and it start down, starts downloading the files. I don't recommend everyone do, does that right now because it's a lot of files. 
<laughs> um, but I wanted to give a clarity on how one might go about that. Is that good? Okay. So finally, we're at the REST API, and I also see my minutes clicking down. So we'll try to get through this somewhat quickly. We do have um, a help on our REST API, which I start with right here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what I'm talking about, so all of our metadata is kept in a database. It's served up as JSON to our portal, and we, our portal is interpreting that JSON to make those pages for you. You could access that JSON directly um, with queries to using our REST API to get all of the information that's being used to generate those pages. So I want to reiterate that all of the portal content is in JSON format. And so right here you'll see this link. And if you see at the end I put question mark format equals JSON. The link where you once were seeing a target, now you're seeing all of the details in format or in JSON. Some of you are going to click on that link and you're going to see a bunch of gobbledygook and you're going to say, wait, what? Um, I recommend that either later today or soon or even right now, you go to Firefox, Chrome, or Safari and download yourself a pretty printer for JSON. And that will magically transform your gobbledygook into something organized like this, where you can click on the minus and plus signs and shrink up or, or decrease the data, and you can look there at your model. A slide that I just realized that I should have had in here, um, you will find um, in our help docs, is we do have a profiles page that is slash profiles that has a list of all of the fields that we use in JSON. Okay, the other take home message that I want you to learn here is that the search queries, when you're clicking on these little boxes here, that's building a URL for you. So I click on RNA seq here and you'll see over here that it now says assay term name is RNA seq. Um, I click here and it says assay term name is DNA seq. Uh, I think when the site went down, I missed a bit, which is that when you click two items within a group, that functions as an or. And if you click two items within different groups, that functions as an and. So um, this will get you anything that is RNA seq or DNA and that will also have to be mouse. So here are some examples of searches. Um, I just want to get ENCODE 3 data. I want to get all data from ENCODE. I want to get ENCODE 3 mouse data. Um, if you're trying to do a search through our data and you're having trouble navigating our, uh, our profiles and our data model, please let us know. Our, the Wranglers are usually super fast at ge generating those. Thank you. So the thing to let you know is that um, your JSON can be retrieved with HTTP requests. Um, so here is an example where I have a small Python bit of code and this should be in your take home messages where okay I can import requests, I can construct my URL, in this case I just say um, I want this particular experiment. I can use the request library to get that URL. I have, now I have this experiment and I turn it into JSON and I can use that response as a dictionary to query in any way that I want the metadata. Here is a more complicated one where I've used a search. I've built an entire search. I want assays that is chip seek. I want human, I want the target investigated as the transcription factor, and I specifically want in vitro differentiated cells. So my hope is that those of you who are planning on access accessing my site completely programmatically, you're like, oh, look, I can just build these URLs, and if I'm confused, I can email you and say, I'm trying to get 
human transcription factors, but just um, these particular transcription factors, and we can help you build that or teach you more specifically how to build that. So, yes. So the URL is the way to do that. One of the things we are discussing is building some sort of shopping cart where you can basically, you've done the query at a particular time and that query has now become the particular list of files that you can save permanently. Yes. <laughs> um, however, right now you just have the URL, which means that if we have future, in the data, uh, in the future if someone has added more data, that URL, if you went there yesterday, it might have 14. You go there tomorrow, it might have 15 because someone has added data. Um, and so, yes, we are talking about a, a shopping cart feature where you would be able to save a fixed list. So wrapping up, I hope that you guys got information about what is a DCC. I hope those of you who have not been to our site can navigate through our site. Um, I hope you understand our vision of browsing and searching so that you can get through the 10,000 experiments to the experiments that you find interesting. Uh, that you understand our vision for downloading and visualizing data. Um, that don't download all the files without the metadata. And that you understand where to get the resources for the REST API and to build that REST API or, or to use that to get information by building you the URL to get the information that you're searching for. Um, and tomorrow, we will discuss the other fabulous things that the DCC does, which is that we build these data processing pipelines so that we can try to have all of the data uh, analyzed in a uniform way, which is not what you found from ENCODE 2. If you go to our site and look at most of the ENCODE 2 data, Sometimes you'll find uniformly processed files, but ENCODE 2, every single lab processed their own files. So there was a lot of variation um, in how the processing was done, and we are working on trying to bring that all up to the same um, uh, harmonized vision, so uh, where everybody's gone through the same exact pipeline. So tomorrow we're gonna have uh, the Pipeline Works workshop and as always, I want you to remember our help desk. And tomorrow night at the poster session, uh, all of the DCC people will be around for help desk sessions. You can talk to us about pipelines. You can talk to us about data access. You can talk to us about features that you would like. You can talk to us about errors that you find on the data. And you can complain about the fact that the site went down today. <laughs> um, and again, I want to acknowledge my staff that we all work together and we are fabulous and I love these this team and my PI and my colleague Ben who <laughs> did not give this talk. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> questions? I'm hoping most of your questions were answered. Yeah, actually, Jason, you need to go. I actually can't hear him. <laughs> That's okay. I got the first part, but I couldn't hear the second part. Yeah. Can you use this JSON tool to automatically download files, not just data on experiments, but the, the files that you showed in this list with the curl command, but from the JSON script and, and get particular files that you are interested in from given experiments? So the answer is sort of yes and no in that if you pull the JSON, it will have the, uh, um, the address to pull the file, but JSON itself isn't a, a method to pull the file. You will have to use something to pull files, right? Okay, so the JSON stores the metadata for the files. One of, that piece of, one of those pieces of metadata is, is not the file, but is the HTTP link for the file. So it has the HTTP link, if you can then go through and find a way to pull it, um, that's great. But it's not like it's embedded in the JSON, 
which is different for our documents, our smaller, like our protocol documents, they're actually embedded in the JSON. So when you pull down the JSON object, the file itself is embedded in there. Um, different, we didn't embed 25 gigabyte fast queues in the JSON. We gave HTTP addresses. Yes. I'm going to turn that to Ben. Should we rate Loon? <laughs> that was, we believe that you shouldn't have to. <laughs> However, um, it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't hurt at this point. We're working really hard in increasing the stability of our site. We m very recently increased the complexity quite a lot and um, the, the fractures are showing, so we're sorry. Other questions? Oh, one more. So um, for mod encode, I believe we have all of the fast queues at this point that we're going to get. For roadmap, the fast queues that are um, not behind dbgap, right, who ha that have um, no accessibility issues, those are starting to come in. We got our first hundred of them last week. So those will start to come in and we'll have those links there. GGR is giving us all of their um, fast queues before they give us the process data. And the same with modern. Does that answer that? Roadmap's coming. Um, and it, it, well, it's coming, and of course, in Roadmap, there's a bunch of data that we can't have it because it's not freely accessible. Anyone? <laughs>